2010, then-governor of California Arnold Schwarzenegger visited Japan, Korea, and China, marveling at their high-speed trains. China's, though still in their infancy, were already faster than any in America, by about 120 miles or 190 kilometers an hour. California's ambitions were modest by comparison, to build one line from San Francisco to LA, about 70% the length of China's longest by 2020, 10 years later. A second phase would connect LA to San Diego down south and Merced to Sacramento up north. Ten years later, California was somehow still ten years away. Meanwhile, the cost had grown from $33 billion in the 2008 proposal, to $53 billion in 2012, to $77 in 2018, two and a third times the original estimate. Still, it gets worse. In an embarrassing illustration of American bureaucracy, its trains, if and when they ever exist, will have two sets of doors at different heights for different stations, after failing to compromise with Caltrain. Then, there's China. While California was busy bickering over the height of its doors and fending off lawsuits, China put its head down and just built. Even after becoming number one in high-speed rail, it never looked back, charging forward until it had surpassed every other nation put together. Then, two-thirds of the entire world total. More impressive is that it did all this as a middle-income country. At the time it began construction, its per capita GDP was just 3,400 current US dollars. If you adjust the length of each nation's high-speed rail by GDP per capita, few others are even visible. But trains are only one high-profile symbol of a much larger pattern. That, while China's methods may be crude and controversial, they are, ultimately, more efficient. The country has dramatically more electric buses, for instance, than anywhere else on the planet, by a crazy margin. One city even built an elevated bus lane, allowing them to zoom past traffic jams. So too does its number of electric charging stations dwarf all other regions by comparison. While Congress hems and haws about big tech monopolies, Chinese authorities just snap their fingers and break them up. American politicians, it's often said, think only one election cycle ahead, whereas Chinese leaders are free to plan 50 or 100 year grand strategies. Or so it may seem. Spawn three ingredients to successful high speed rail. First, and most obvious, you need lots of people. Not just a large number, but ideally a string of high-density clusters. Check. The vast majority of the 100 Chinese cities with a population over 1 million are, quite conveniently, clumped together on its eastern coastal side. Second, it can't be too expensive. Again, no problem. In addition to the much lower cost of labor, the sheer scale of China's plans allowed construction companies to optimize every step of the process, and amortize large investments over significantly longer time and project horizon. A report by the World Bank found that its average cost was at least 40% cheaper than the European equivalent. It didn't hurt that everything, up to and including the trains themselves, were built in China. Third, and finally, a good candidate for high-speed rail is rich. This, it most certainly, was not. But with annual GDP growth over 10% at the time, it wasn't crazy to think it would soon get there. Its first few routes connected wealthy first, second, and third-tier cities like Nanjing, the fifth richest, to Guangzhou, the thirteenth. They were also the right length. For trips shorter than roughly 100 miles, it generally makes more sense to drive or take a bus, especially given that many stations are far outside city centers. Conversely, for trips longer than about 750 miles, it's usually preferable to fly. These journeys take upwards of 5 hours on even the fastest trains. The space between 100 and 750 miles, but especially below 500, is the Goldilocks zone for high-speed rail. Too far to drive, yet not far enough to fly. 
8 out of its first 10 routes had total lengths within these bounds. It all seemed pretty sensible. And had it stopped there in 2010, it would still today have the longest high-speed rail network of any country. Even building nothing new for the next 12 years, it would still go down in history as a tremendous accomplishment in speed, scale, and cost. Instead, China kept building, and building, and building, and building. Now, this wasn't its original intention. Far from a grand strategic plan, it, along with much of what we know as modern China today, were reactions. Reactions to the 2008 financial crisis. 45% of its nearly $600 billion stimulus package went toward transport and power infrastructure. It seemed like the perfect time to seize the opportunity and get ahead, rather than sit back and wait until its infrastructure was already crumbling, like the US. But it was still, at its core, a gamble. One giant assumption that demand would materialize and that increased interconnectivity would drive greater economic growth. This was not as sound a bet as it may seem. For anyone living in the US or other rich countries, high-speed rail probably looks like a cheaper, more environmentally sound alternative to air travel. But the data clearly shows that, in China, the biggest competitor to high-speed trains are older, cheaper, low-speed trains. In a 2015 survey, about half of all passengers said they otherwise would have taken conventional trains. Only a small minority say they would have flown. The problem is cost. One study found the average cost to build a 350 km an hour line was 90% higher than even a 250 km one. Which is still, by the way, considered high speed. This is, in large part, because the faster lines use elevated tracks, which, given China's softer soils, would compress and sink over time, causing a safety risk. To prevent this, the fastest trains require extensive use of bridges and viaducts, which are significantly more expensive than roadbed, made of sand, rock, and gravel. And that's just the construction. These are not Legos, build once and play forever. They also have operating costs. Energy use is not linear with respect to speed. Electricity consumption increases much faster with every additional kilometer per hour. All of this is to say that extra bit of speed is really expensive. Conventional trains cost roughly two to three cents per kilometer. High speed, triple that. Take a random route on a random day. Let's say Guangzhou to Shanghai. The fastest route takes 6 hours, 48 minutes, and costs $124. The slow journey takes nearly a full day, but costs just $31. Anyone watching this video would likely jump at the opportunity to spend just $93 more dollars to save a whole 16 hours of travel time. But the same can't be assumed in China. Though there's no definitive value of time, most estimates use the average hourly wage for business travelers and no more than half that amount for leisure. A quick back-of-the-envelope calculation reveals the 5.8 US dollars per hour saved would be just marginally worthwhile for the average business traveler, but not for the average leisure traveler. Another way of visualizing this is by splitting the population into 10 equal-sized groups by income. What this shows is that $93 is at least half of weekly income for about 60% of China's population. Of course, in reality, a disproportionate number of the remaining highest income travelers will simply opt for air travel instead. Others actually prefer the slower option. Say, for example, you have one day of meetings or events to attend the next day. The sleeper train saves you from the one night you'd otherwise spend at a hotel anyway. Now, it would be wrong to say that demand never materialized. Just look at how busy stations get around Chinese New Year. But the undertaking can hardly be called a success, either. Individual lines vary across the spectrum from extremely popular to catastrophically empty. Although these numbers are wildly out of date, pay attention to the difference between them. 
While some routes see 20 or 30 million passengers a year, like Beijing to Shanghai or Shanghai to Nanjing, elsewhere, quote, the scale of investment seems difficult to justify, says a Beijing professor of economics. Zhengzhou to Xi'an is, on average, less than 50% full. Huaibei to Shanghai as low as 21%. In fact, the majority of routes lose money. According to the World Bank, out of 31 lines, just 5 are at least break-even. 4 were unable to pay back the principal on their loans, 11 also their interest, and another 11 were unable even to cover their operating costs. The 1,700km route connecting Xinjiang to the capital of Gansu province in the largely empty Gobi Desert runs just 8 out of the 320 daily trains it was designed to handle. It loses money even on electricity, meaning there's no hope of paying back its other operating costs, to say nothing of the interest on its loans, and you can forget about the principal. To keep the lights on, operators have continuously taken on new debt to pay off the old, in a vicious cycle. No one is quite sure how this ends. You might argue that high-speed rail doesn't need to be profitable, that it can exist purely as a public good. This may be true, but efficiency is defined as output divided by input, how much do you get out for every dollar or hour you put in. There's no denying China's incredible output, the fruits of which are plainly clear to see. But too often are speed and scale marveled at for their own sake, with no regard for their cost or context. The point is that China didn't crack the code on high-speed rail. It didn't discover or invent some new method or technology that made it cheaper, faster, or more widespread. Rather, it paid the price. A tremendous price. And there's no reason to think that any other country, including the US, couldn't accomplish the same thing if it similarly abandoned all financial constraints. $900 billion of debt can buy quite a lot of rail. Even setting aside financial measures, it's unclear that high-speed rail had a net positive effect. Its singular, almost religious obsession with building more and more and more high-speed rail, well past its usefulness, has diverted funds away from conventional rail, on which freight trains depend. While slow trains are certainly less exciting, their underinvestment, and in some cases dismantling, has led to a rise in road transport, which is good for no one, not least the planet. This is not the image of a government free from political considerations, quietly and competently pursuing the most optimal policies according to one grand strategic plan. Instead, this, like many of its superlative-laced megaprojects, the Three Gorges Dam, the Hong Kong-Zhuhai-Macau Bridge, and others, are designed, first and foremost, to impress. They benefit from a fundamental psychological tendency to view other, faraway countries as possessing the solutions to our own. If America can't build cost-effective high-speed rail because of endless red tape, its pervasiveness in China must be evidence of success, rather than a reflection of its own unique flavor of bureaucratic inefficiency. The mistake is assuming that because China lacks your country's exact problems, that it must be free of its own. 